Excellent. So first of all, uh, there wasn't much of an introduction about who I am, and that reminded me of a story a couple of years ago that I found out that I get to a certain age in Australia, anyone over 65, that you can apply for an Australian Seniors Health Care Card, which means if you do get sick, that you can get uh, cheaper medications and faster service, because it's nice to look after your elderly monks <laughs> and, nuns and the citizens. So I got on the computer and I tried to sort of uh, get a healthcare card, typing in all of the information they wanted. But then they said no, that I needed to come in personally because they were afraid of identity fraud. I don't know who would like to take my identity, <laughs> but if you did, Take it. <laughs> so I made an appointment with a local office over there in Australia. They call it Centrelink, which deals with you know, such um, applications. So I went there, made the appointment, and this woman, she was a senior officer in that government social service department, and she said, uh, Ajahn Brahma Wangso, We've asked you to come in. Can you please prove who you are? And my answer was, Madam, I've been trying to answer that question for the last 48 years. <laughs> as a monk, as a Buddhist, you've got to try and find out who are you? And said, I don't know. And she laughed for a minute, and then she said, no, look, this is serious. She didn't know who I was. I don't do serious. Oh, sometimes I do. But then she said, look, we need some ID, personal identification, especially with a photo on it. So can I see your driver's license? I said, I'm a monk. I don't have a driver's license. OK, can I see your credit card? <laughs> I don't have a credit card. Your, your bank statement. I don't have a bank account. Well, let's see your rental agreement for your place you live. I actually live in a cave. <laughs> Honestly, I do. Some of you have seen. How many of you have seen my cave where I live? Yeah, so it's true. I live in a cave. And so you don't have to have a rental agreement for a cave. Maybe if it was a natural cave from the bear who owns it. But it's not owned by a bear. It's owned by actually no one. So I said, no, I don't have a rental agreement. What about your, your house um, loan agreement or your possession of a house? I don't own anything. Oh, she said. Well, what about your marriage certificate? <laughs> I said, I'm a monk. You don't get married. <laughs> and she asked for all these things which you usually have to supply to prove you exist. I didn't have any of them. And so she looked at me and told me, according to the Australian government, Ajahn Brahm, you don't exist. <laughs> and I put my hands up and said, yes, the Buddha was right. <laughs> now that was a stressful situation for her. Not for me, I was having the time of my life. I was enjoying this. And then she said, well, I've got a passport, and it does so happen I've still got the passport for the place where I was born, a British passport, and also an Australian passport. Unfortunately, I don't have a Malaysian passport yet. <laughs> oh, I'll leave that for you later on. <laughs> but she said, well, I'm not supposed to take two passports. I said, that's all I've got. But because I was causing so much uh, happy problems for her, she said, OK, go through. So she, she signed off on my senior's health care card, 
just because if she'd have waited any longer, she'd have got just more, uh, I suppose, annoyance, but more problems from me. And I've always noticed that, that if you're ever in any difficulties, any stressful situations, a good sense of humor really is a wonderful way of getting successful outcomes. Now, I don't know how many of you have been to the new edition of the Buddhist, Fellow Buddhist Gem Fellowship, that top room, which is the first time I've seen it. I know uh, that, uh, Victor was telling me about the plans the last time I was here, but that was about three or four years ago. Now it's completed, and in, in there, you've got a little stupa with relics of the Lord Buddha in it. Wow. So these relics of the Lord Buddha are very special. Many years ago, I think when I was, I think in Thailand, a Burmese monk came to see me, and he said that he was um, collecting these Buddhist relics you know, from upcountry Burma. Many places in Burma had these old uh, reliquaries, you know, stupas, and because over the many years, you know, people come, people go, the jungle takes over, and some of these great stupas in the middle of the jungle and no one knows where they are. And when the jungle takes over the buildings of the stupas, they fall down and they become just um, destroyed stupas. So he was trying to find out as many of these destroyed temples as he possibly could and then save the relics from them. So he told me that one of his contacts said there was a villager in a remote village uh, in the north of Burma and had suddenly become rich. And this monk wanted to find out why. And this villager, he didn't give up the information easily. But when he found out this was a good monk, he had nothing really to lose. He said that in a deep part of the jungle, they had found a destroyed stupa. And when he was looking at the uh, remains, he found a golden casket. This is not a joke, this is a true story. Found a golden casket and it had some bones in it, he threw the bones out. But he kept the golden casket and sold it in the market and that's where he got this, this big windfall of money from. And so the monk said, look, I will give you some extra money if you can tell me where you found that casket. I don't want the casket, I want the bones which were in there. These would be relics. So this villager took this monk to this remote part of the jungle. The monk found some of these relics and put them in a, a proper casket. And this monk later on, when he saw me, he said, I know that you're a good monk, Ajahn Brahm, and that you are trying to do good things for the Buddhist communities uh, in places like Australia. I want to present these relics to you. And so he presented me with a number of very, very beautiful relics of the Buddha. Now, what do I do next? I said, I've got to take these relics into Australia. Now, I don't know how many of you have been into Australia. The customs are so strict. They have dogs which sniff you, um, machines which x-ray you and all of your luggage. And in fact, at this time of the year, they're very, very strict. And I don't know if I told you this story before, but once they were checking this one man's baggage He'd just been over to Europe, to France. And when they checked his baggage, they asked him if he had anything to declare. He said, no, nothing. But when they opened his suitcase, what they found inside the suitcase, under some jackets and jumpers, were two bottles of whiskey. He said, what are these? And the traveler, thinking quickly, he said, uh, uh, these... This is holy water. 
I just went on pilgrimage to the city of Lourdes in France. And this is holy water in there. Okay, can I go? And a customs officer said, I've got to check this. And when he looked at the label, it says Johnny Walker on the outside. <laughs> and the man said, well, I've got to put them in some bottle. This was just two empty bottles which I found. So I put the holy water in that. It's just holy water, that's all. Can I go? And the customs officer said, no, I've got to check this. So the customs officer opened the lid on one of the bottles and the customs officer smelt it and asked the traveller to smell it. He said, this isn't water, this is whiskey. And the man smelt it too and said, oh my goodness, it's another miracle. <laughs> And that is why, and this is true, that if ever you look at what you're allowed to import into Australia and what you're not allowed to import, one of those is holy water. You're not allowed to import holy water into Australia. Just in case it might change on the journey. But anyway, so I knew, I knew how strictly the customs were in Australia. And I had all these Buddha relics. And when I looked in the form, you have to declare these things, because Buddhist monks, we have to be honest. We can't cheat at all. And so when I filled out the form, I found out there was um, one category there, I think, for animal parts or human parts. So I ticked that. And I said, what have you got? He said, these are human remains. <laughs> and they had a look at them. What human remains are they? They're bones. But they're all in these very well-sealed containers. Like if you see the relic caskets which people have, all very well-sealed in glass, you can see through them. And the customs officer said, whose relics? I said, the Lord Buddha's. And the customs man said, this is too difficult for me, so call the boss in. And the boss said, what are you trying to import into Australia? These are Buddha relics, they're bones. He had a look at them, he looked at me, <laughs> and he said, this is way too difficult for me, get out of here. <laughs> <laughs> and that's what he said. So he went straight through. In stressful situations, honesty, and humor always make you succeed. You don't need to buy into that stress and get worried. Instead, we have these other beautiful Buddhist ways of dealing with what many people call stress. Because it is the attitude you have to what you have to do in life. It's more important than anything else. Now I know that somebody this morning they were asking me that how I always did well in the stressful exams which I did as a young man. And one of those stressful exams, which I will never forget, at least it was supposed to be stressful, was the, what we call the final exams at Cambridge University in theoretical physics. Wow. Is that tough? No, it's easy. <laughs> if you think it's tough, then you will be stressful and you will fail. One of the things which I learned, I was already a Buddhist by that time for about two or three years, already meditating. And I had some tricks which I learned from, from Buddhism which helped me enormously. One of those tricks was the series of examinations at Cambridge in natural sciences, the, the big area of which theoretical physics was a part, was a series of six exams, sorry, 12 exams. A three hour paper in the morning, hour for lunch, followed by a three hour paper in the afternoon on Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday and Saturday, six days in a row, 
three hours in the morning, three hours in the afternoon, on simple subjects like quantum mechanics or astrophysics of the galaxy. <laughs> so, people told me this is really important. All the other years at that university counted for absolutely nothing. It was all down to those final exams. You passed or you failed. And I thought at that time, actually I thought afterwards, if only, if only I had known I was going to become a monk, I wouldn't have worried so much. <laughs> but I never knew that at the time. But one of the things which I did do, I never had lunch during those six days. I had a big breakfast, and I was a lay person then, I had a big dinner in the evening, but never any lunch. Instead, I went back to my room, sat on my cushion, and meditated for 30 minutes. What happened when you try and meditate in a time of what I thought was a lot of stress? What happened was, as soon as I closed my eyes, it was hard to stop thinking about the morning exam which I'd just completed. Did I do it correctly? Did I answer well? Did I add enough explanation? And you all know that the past is finished. The exam paper has already been submitted. I can't change anything now. That's what happens in the past. You cannot change the past. Unless, apparently, this gentleman still exists. I saw this on the BBC news site. Doctor Who. Do you know Doctor Who? It goes in a time capsule and can dro go back in time. Unfortunately, I didn't have his email, so I couldn't call him. <laughs> so the past is finished. Now, one of the nice things about practicing some meditation, being wise, it was much easier to let go of the past. It was done with, bye-bye past. And so as soon as I let go of the past, the morning exam, and all those thoughts and worries disappeared, what do you think I thought of next? The afternoon exam, coming in about half an hour's time. Should I get out a book and start to do some revision on the last minute? I used to be a school teacher before I became a monk. It's one of the things which I advise all the students. Whatever you revise an hour before the examination never ever comes up in the paper. <laughs> You're wasting your time. And I could do that. I could let go of the future, not worry about it, because I realized the right now is where your future is made. I needed to rest, to relax, to get my brain working at full capacity. If it was worried about the future, it couldn't really rest right now. I'd wear myself out. So I let go of the future. And the next thing which I noticed shocked me. The next thing which I noticed is my body was shaking. I never regarded myself as someone who was fearful or anxious. But this was a high stress time. Final examinations. And everybody else was more scared of it than I was. You have to do well. You have to succeed, said all your friends and your family. But when I could actually see what that was doing to me, my body was shaking. It's not that hard to actually look at that body with some mindfulness and kindness and to relax everything. So my body would stop shaking. It could relax and be peaceful. And the last thing I noticed after my body became still was how tired my brain was. Have you ever been working really hard? And take a look about your brain power. It's close to zero. You can't do very much more. You're exhausted. You all know that feeling. You want us to write an email, and the words just don't come out. 
or you're trying to give a talk and you can't think of anything interesting or new to t talk to people, your brain is just really struggling to have ideas. But the other thing which I know from meditating, all you need to do if you are that tired is to be quiet, to rest in this moment, to be still. Stillness generates energy. And it generates innovation and ideas. Your mind becomes clear and it can communicate. And that's what I did. For five minutes, I was still inside. And so when I came out of my meditation, my brain was re-energized. It's like you have a mobile phone and it's run out of juice, so you plug it in and recharge it. That's how I recharge my energies. And so in the afternoon, it's not just doing something stressful without any stress. When I went into that afternoon examination, I never knew this at the time, but my friends told me I was the only student who went into the afternoon examinations smiling. <laughs> and the reason I was smiling was not because I knew the answers. It was just you were relaxed and energized. You know, some of the fellow students, they thought I was cheating. Was I cheating? Not uh, officially cheating, but I knew some things which the other students didn't know about how to be in a stressful situation, to relax, be happy, have a smile on your face. And of course, I did very well. And I've taught that method to so many different schools. Even one year, I tried to make it that you um, contact people of other religions, because I notice I've got to be very careful as a senior monk, you don't just surround yourself with other monks or nuns or Buddhists. You want to have a wide group of people who can let you know other ways of thinking about things, who can give you some feedback. If you just get people who are yes people around you, then of course you never get any positive criticisms or any comments to make you improve your performance as a nun or as a monk. So one of those people, one of my very good friends, he was a Jewish rabbi. Moshe Bernstein is a very good friend. And he was a very good friend because when I was talking to him about one of the things in Buddhism, like rebirth and reincarnation, he told me, oh yeah, we believe in that as well. And I thought, my goodness, do Jewish tradition believe in rebirth? And I checked it out with another senior Jewish rabbi and he said, Rabbi Bernstein is very unique. <laughs> In other words, most of the Jewish tradition do not believe in rebirth, but he does. And because he was a rebel, I thought, yeah, he's my friend. <laughs> but anyway, he got the job of being the, uh, the chaplain of one of, of the, the big Jewish school over in Perth. And so he said, we're really struggling here with our you know, the year entr the university entrance examinations, and we don't think our kids are going to do well at all. Can you please ke come into the school and help just teach about a little bit of meditation and how to pass the exams? And of course, I was very happy to go there and teach these uh, uh, year, they call them year 12s in Australia, 17, 18 year olds, about to do the examinations to go to university, to teach them the sort of things I've just taught you, how to let go of the past and the future, to be very clear that your body is relaxed and your mind is energized. And when I left, they did the exams a few days later, and I got this wonderful letter back from the principal of the Jewish school in Perth, saying, thank you so much, Ajahn Brahm. You may have heard, and I hadn't heard, because I don't watch the news on TV or read that many newspapers, 
we got top school of the year this year for our university entrance. Thank you so much. It was teaching those young men and young women just how to be successful without any stress. And I teach that to so many, especially young people. You're going into an interview for a good job. How do you do that? How can you be successful without getting stressed out? Now look, if you were a boss and someone came into your organization on an interview, what impresses you? It's not just what they've done at university. I remember this one story of this uh, man who was working in a supermarket, just you know, sweeping the floors. And the, the boss said, no, you're not doing it right. And the guy said, look, I've graduated from university with first class honors. I just can't get a job right now. I'm only doing this part time. And the boss of the supermarket replied, I didn't realize you went to university. I should have taught you how to sweep. Now you hold a broom like this, <laughs> and you sweep it like that. <laughs> so anyway, that if you're going to do a job, whatever that job is, what impresses you of a person who's going to be successful in that job? If they're already stressed out, you know they're not going to last that long. They're going to get sick. They're going to get unhealthy. So instead of feeling that you have to have, you have to work hard and push yourself, instead we have these other ways of learning how to be successful with hardly any stress at all. For those of you who've known me, I have so many responsibilities. This evening, the reason why I have to go up to um, an office and get my tablet out to do a, a Zoom uh, meeting, it is with our Bikuni organization in England. I was over there a couple of weeks ago because you know, we've managed to get the first Bikuni residence in UK, in Oxford, in a beautiful, quiet, northern corner of Oxford, just a short walk away from the River Thames. But they have a committee, or rather a trust. You know who's the chairperson of the trust? <laughs> I'm not the chairperson, I'm the chair monk. <laughs> Whatever you call me. Just to give it some support and get it going. So I'm I have so many responsibilities. You only mentioned a few of them. I will mention many of the others now. Okay, I'm the chair monk of the Anukampa Bikuni Trust, I'm having a meeting this evening, it's the AGM. I am the, uh, the founding member of the Australian Sangha Association, the Abbot of Bodhinyana Monitor, which you know, the spiritual director, actually they call me as a nickname, the spiritual dictator, of the Buddhist Society of Western Australia, <laughs> the spiritual patron of the Buddhist Society of Victoria, the spiritual director of the Cambodian Buddhist Society in Perth, the spiritual uh, pa patron, I'm mean, the advisor of the BS, uh, of uh, BGF, aren't I? Yes. Okay, okay. I think the spiritual patron of the Buddhist Fellowship over in Singapore, a few of them are here today. Where are you? I saw you earlier. Yeah, Buddhist Fellowship. They're supposed to be working today, but they've taken time off to come up here. And not just the spiritual something of the Bodhinyana Singapore, that's Angie's group. And what else am I? Oh, yeah. The spiritual patron of Ahi Pasako Foundation over in. Uh, Sri Lanka, uh, over in uh, Indonesia, and also uh, we've got the Brahm Center in Colombo, so I'm the spiritual something of that too, not quite sure what. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
is lots of responsibilities, lots of duties. There's lots of people who are depending upon me for their success in life. Do I look stressed? <laughs> How can you do that with so many responsibilities without having stress? It's very easy. You can only be at one place at one time. I'm right now, I'm giving a talk here at the BGF. So this is all that I'm focusing on. It's one thing at a time practice. I don't really worry where I'm going to go next. Some people ask me, what are you doing tomorrow? Actually, I don't know. I'm going to ask you. Even the talk this evening. The talk, what is the talk again about can you be successful without having stress? I only knew the topic of the talk when I asked in the car when I came here about an hour before, no, about half an hour before I arrived. Was that true, Venables? Where's Venable Rahuli yet? See, that's true, he told me. No preparation at all. That means you don't have any stress. You don't know what you're going to talk about. <laughs> you just make it up as you go along. And apparently it's quite popular. That's why many people listen to those talks online. And sometimes I learn something from my talks. Sometimes something comes into your head and you say it and it's really wise. <laughs> <laughs> so this is where you don't stress out, but you work with life rather than fight against life. It's fighting against life is where you get stress from. Instead, I enjoy giving talks. I enjoy signing books. <laughs> I just make fun out of it by putting smiley faces on the signatures. Or are those of you who are lucky enough to get the Bear Awareness book, I start off with a bear face for the A in Ajahn Brahm. I enjoy it. And hopefully that joy is infectious. I always say that I don't know why you've got masks on. You don't want to share COVID, but you won't share COVID here. You'll share laughter. And laughter and fun and joy. And that's a magnificent therapy. COVID, what is it? It's a respiratory problem. And every time you laugh, you are exercising your lungs and making them stronger, and making them more COVID resistant. That wasn't la a loud enough laugh. COVID resistance. <laughs> <laughs> That's exercise for your lungs. So what that actually does is that fun and joy takes away the stress of even having COVID. You know, I'm honest with you, in all those years when COVID started, I never got COVID. I became so disappointed. <laughs> Honestly, all the other monks, whenever they got COVID, they get a seven day retreat. <laughs> and they don't have to do any work. This is, I change attitudes and the problem disappears. Because I, I want to get COVID, I never get it. Or one of the other problems, I'm now flying again. You know, just traveling to, no, it's not, not actually the, yes, yeah, the first time to Malaysia since COVID. And people before, they used to tell me, Ajahn Brahm, be careful. You know, in a tube of people just all confined, you're going to get COVID too, or even worse. You know, like in those old days, that people would blow up aircraft or they'd shoot missiles at them if you flew over the Middle East. And to get to London, you had to fly over the Middle East. There's no other way to go. So Ajahn Brahm, please don't go. Please. And that's, of course, to those of you who remember, just to counter any fear of getting blown up in an aircraft explosion at 30,000 feet. I developed the three benefits of dying at 30,000 feet in an aircraft explosion. It's very, very positive. 
First of all, if you die in an aircraft explosion at 30,000 feet, it's an instant cremation. <laughs> you, don't have, you don't have to arrange these expensive things with funeral directors and have to wait until your body gets put in a box somewhere. And it's done on the spot. Not only that, but <laughs> your ashes are scattered. <laughs> you don't have to worry about what to do with the ashes. So that's the first benefit. Instant cremation with the benefit of your ashes being, being scattered. Number two, how much does a funeral cost in Malaysia? Yes, yeah, so instead of that, you should give it to was the, the Arya Wihara project instead. <laughs> 30,000. That's a lot of ringgit. But no, not only that, it costs a lot of money. And also you have to have, if it's a Chinese tradition, there's having all this food for three or four days, inviting everybody, even people you don't know, and they come and have a good meal at your expense. <laughs> it's very expensive. But if you die at 30,000 feet in aircraft explosion, you don't have to pay anything. Actually, your family gets money back from insurance. <laughs> so it's an economic positive for you. But the best benefit of all, if you die in an aircraft explosion at 30,000 feet, you're so close to heaven, it's easy to go the rest of the way. <laughs> So because of that, the next time you go in an aircraft, just hope to be blown up. <laughs> That's how you overcome stress. You know, worries at all. And sometimes when you see the funny side of life, look, how many of you have got very bad sicknesses and worried about how many months or years you have to live? Some people, they do have tumours, they do have these diseases, and they get so stressed out by those diseases, often it's the stress that kills them rather than the disease. So, how do we overcome this? Imagine, just imagine, that today, at this talk, we had a special prize for somebody. It would be chosen by your seat number, and the prize would be a seven-day holiday in Los Angeles, flying first class for you and your selected friend with $1,000 US each to, to spend at your favorite stores, staying in a first class, no, first class, a six-star hotel in Los Angeles and having dinner every evening with a different pop star or Hollywood movie star, whichever you prefer, every night. You can choose. Who would you like to have dinner with? Taylor Swift? <laughs> Who else is popular? Kenya Reeves. Who? Kenya Reeves? I don't know. But you can choose a different star every evening that would have dinner with you and your friend. And a thousand dollars each to spend at luxury stores in Los Angeles. Staying in a six star hotel and with a first class trip back to KL when it's all over. And suppose I said and the lucky winner is you. Would you be excited? Would you be counting down the days until the aircraft took off? Which is better, going on such a holiday to Los Angeles or going to some beautiful heaven realm? <laughs> Which is better? <laughs> a heaven realm. So why is it when you're about to die, you think, oh, I don't want to die? You'll be counting down the days and the doctor says, you've only got a week to live. You say, please, can you make it three days? I can't wait. <laughs> that way you don't get stressed out about dying. Bring it on, bring it on. <laughs> and of course, people like that don't die. It's the stress which kills you. 
There's one of my uh, acquaintances. His name was Ted. He was English English. And he's getting so old. In his time, everyone used to smoke cigarettes. And he used to smoke, and so eventually he got lung cancer. So bad, eventually he went into one of these places called a hospice. It's like a, a medical facility where you only go in on your feet, you go out in a box. <laughs> it's like a last resort. And they've given up on trying to treat you. You just basically make life comfortable and pain-free as you possibly can before you die. So when Ted went into one of these hospices, and I uh, saw him in there, he told me that the first night he was in this hospice, the nurse came up to him and said, what would you like to eat for dinner tonight? And he said, well, look, I've got diabetes, so I can't eat anything which is sugary or syrupy. I've also got cholesterol problems, so I can't have anything oily. I've got hardened arteries, so I can't have anything salty. And he went through all this list of things which he couldn't eat because it was bad for his health. And the nurse looked at him and said, Ted, you're not going to die of a heart attack. You're not going to die of hardened arteries or cholesterol problems. You're going to die in about four or five days from your cancer. You don't have to worry at all about what you eat. You can eat whatever you like. And apparently the nurse told me that Ted's eyes went wide. You mean I can have any uh, sweet, syrupy, oily, salty food I like? <laughs> yes, Ted. The cancer's going to get you, not the, <laughs> not the food. So he ordered all of these, what's supposed to be called unhealthy foods, which he hadn't eaten for years because his wife would never let him. That's bad for you, that's bad for you, that's bad for you. He ate all these syrupy, sweet, oily, salty foods. And he enjoyed them so much. This is not a joke, this is true. After six days, he walked out of that hospital. He was in remission. And he had another six months of life. Now, that's a true story. I like repeating it. What does that tell you? It was the stress of worrying he's going to die, which was bad for his health. When he stopped worrying and he enjoyed some of his favorite foods, he got an extra six months of life for that, and an enjoyable six months too. Remember the power of joy and happiness for your success in life. So because of that, I meant to tell this story, but it's an old one. I'll tell it very quickly. But I became quite famous for this story. Why I became famous for it, I was invited by uh, a couple of uh, friends, they were Sri Lankans, to actually to give a, a session, a little talk, at a computer conference in Brisbane many years ago. Now, if you see me using the tablet, which I'm going to use this evening, I am just so bad on computers. That's young people's stuff, not my people. I'm 72 now, too old to be an expert on computers. But nevertheless, on this little conference on computer studies, I gave my presentation and people loved it. I remember one of them said, that's the first session on this big conference where I did not look at my mobile phone. Because it was interesting what you were saying. So thank you for that. And what I said was actually also uh, transcribed and put in the Australian newspaper. And because of that, I got very highly respected by this computer conference. So a few years later, I got this very lovely invite to the World Computer Conference <laughs> in South Korea, Daejeon. 
and they paid business class tickets all the way from Perth to Korea, put me up in a five-star hotel. And they also gave a $2,000 donation to Bodhinyana Monastery. In London, where I was born, they call that a nice little earner. <laughs> but when I got there, I was not supposed to just give a talk, but give the keynote address. That's the first address you give at conferences, so to set the tone of what you're doing. And so they had all these big shots, you know, from South Korea, all the heads of um, Samsung and other stuff. I remember just having a nice chat with the head of the European cyber security. But many of them said, we've never heard of you, Ajahn Brahm. How come you're here? <laughs> and I told them one of these little anecdotes. I said to them that over a hundred years earlier in the town of St. Louis in the southern part of the United States, there was an event called the World's Fair, the St. Louis World's Fair. And of course, at all these events, people have to eat. So they had all these stalls selling different types of food. And it just so happened, just by chance, that the store which sold ice cream was right next to the store which sold American waffles. You know what waffles are, like they're pancakes? So the two of these people running these stores became quite good friends. So they decided after having become friends, how can we combine our two different types of food? Waffles and ice cream. And that is where the ice cream cone was invented. Just a chance coming together of two different types of food, waffles and ice cream. And they got the ice cream cone. And so I said to the people of the World Computer Conference in Daejeon, now we've got IT experts and a Buddhist monk. When those two come together, who knows what's going to come out of this? <laughs> but it is true, if you're just in just one narrow uh, field, you don't have other ways of looking at things, of course you just get literally narrow-minded. So what I told them and what they liked very much, actually I'll do it as I told them, I held up something. And I said, what is this? I said, bottle of water. Keep looking, what is it? What is it? Plastic. What is it? Blue on the outside. What is it? What is it? And I kept asking the question, what is it? What is it? What is it? At first they didn't know what I was up to, but at least they played along. <laughs> and when they actually stopped sort of uh, giving what they thought would be a correct answer. I said, now you've run out of answers. Now you may be able to see different uses for this. If you're a housewife and you need to make some sort of pastry, it's a very good rolling pin. <laughs> if you have, like, a dog is making a noise, I shouldn't say that, should I? But when you have innovation, you stop seeing this as everybody else sees it. You see it anew, a different usage. That is where people get these incredible breakthroughs. And this is actually where, not through stress, but through fun, seeing things in a different way. Seeing things like I've already explained, you go on an aircraft, you're not afraid of being shot down. I figured this out a long time ago when people say, well look, you know, you may survive the explosion, but at 30,000 feet you're falling to the ground. What can you do? I said, listen, these robes are very big. <laughs> I just hold on to four corners, they'll be my parachute. 
That's called innovation. <laughs> but they said, but what happens? You might fall into uh, you know, a, a terrorist stronghold. It's no problem at all. I said, I'll just take my robe <laughs> and put a slit over here. <laughs> Innovation. <laughs> so when you say things like this, you don't get stressed out, you have more fun in life. And when you're fun, you become successful without any stress at all. I enjoy my life, even just you know, giving talks, chatting to you, uh, talking about, you know, I don't know, many people get way too stressed. They're trying to find even like a partner to share their life with in this world. How can you find a successful marriage? You should ask the experts, Buddhist monks. <laughs> So how do we know how to live a successful marriage? It's so easy. Look, one thing, piece of advice, people argue in a marriage. But you know, you have to make a decision about these things in a marriage. So we figured out, if you're in a marriage, you're always arguing with your partner. Try this, it's called the calendar method. If it's an odd day of the week, the 1st, the 3rd, the 5th, 7th, 9th, 11th, 13th, 15th, 17th, etc., then the wife is always right. <laughs> you don't have to argue, just look at the calendar. Oh, what day is it today? <laughs> no, what day of the week? 18th. So on the even days of the month, the man is always right. So don't even try arguing, ladies. Today, the 18th, the man is always right. So be careful, guys, because tomorrow she's right. <laughs> At least you can make a decision, and it's fair. Actually, it's not fair, is it? There's more odd days of a m in the year than there are even days. But guys, it's worth it <laughs> for peace and quiet. <laughs> so wait... And actually, people have tried that, and it works. The only problem is now, especially in countries like Australia, they've got same-sex marriages, and so I don't know what to do. <laughs> <laughs> both are right on the same day, and both are wrong on the same day as well. <laughs> so anyhow, that's called innovation seeing things in a different way and trying things out in a different way. And that lessens stress. But how you get to that innovation in the first place is having this playfulness. Where I learned that was in the Cavendish Laboratories in, in Cambridge University. Where they told us, look, play around with the instruments. Do things in a different way. Because when you're playing around with stuff, you are trying new things, things which haven't been done before. You're not just going over old things, but going over new things. And it's amazing just how, when you have a playful attitude towards your life, how innovation happens. How you see things which work, which you've never done before. How you can invent ice cream cones. And you can do things which are powerful. And great for like a country like Malaysia. Innovation is really important to be able to get strong economic growth and prosperity for yourself, prosperity for your country, enough spare cash to donate to the area we have. <laughs> <laughs> if you're not prosperous, you know, you don't have any money to give to anybody. So that's really important to have that innovation, that fun. That joy. And I still remember, I can see Datuk Victor just smiling at me. I remember one of the conferences we went to a long time ago, and he was presenting, and this lady just stood up to ask a question, a very deep question on Buddhism. And she said, and I'm going to ask this of Datuk Victor Wee, but I request that he sings the answer with his guitar. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> I always remember that. That was innovative. It was a bit challenging too, but nevertheless, it's fun. And when you do something which is fun and innovative, it's amazing how successful that can be. You don't stress out at all. But anyway, I was going to say about stress. You've heard this many times before. How heavy is the cup? The longer you hold it, the heavier it feels. I've said this so many times, but please remember it. If this gets too heavy to hold comfortably, what should you do? Put it down for five minutes. Try it yourself. When you pick it up again after five minutes, it's right. If you've got any job you need to do, any task which you need to perform, be mindful enough to know that your brain is not functioning at its top potential. You're tired. So go and take a rest. I don't know actually what they call the, the WCs here in KL, but in the US, you know what they call them? Rest rooms. Rest rooms are great for having a rest. So if you get stuffed up in your brain, you go to the restroom for 15 minutes. <laughs> and when you, you don't go there to do toilet, you just go there to meditate. <laughs> the seats are nice and soft, sort of. And then after 15 minutes, when you meditate there, you relax. After all, you know, what are they there for? The toilets are there for letting go. And you sit, on the <laughs> you sit on those toilets, you relax, they go over all the problems and stuff. And then afterwards, you go back and you're far more efficient and innovative at your job. And if the boss complains, said, why do you always spend so much time on the toilet? And your answer is, you don't lie, you're a Buddhist, you can't lie. He said, because I'm constipated. You were constipated, I mean, not in your bowels, you're constipated in your brain. <laughs> it's a good way to overcome that. So you can have a wonderful, innovative life without getting stressed out. Relax. To the max. I relax to the max and I can perform a lot, even as a 72-year-old. That's how it's done. Thank you for listening. Okay, now we have the three C's. Questions, comments and complaints. <laughs> the first one is the key, obviously. Okay, so have you got any comments? Yeah, we've got one up there. Can you kind of shout it out? Any from the higher realms? You're supposed to be more intelligent in the higher realms up there. <laughs> okay. This is good for, what you good? Who's gonna get the first question? It's good for our MCs because they have to run up the stairs and get some fit and healthy. <laughs> Who's got the first question? Yes. Okay. I've got another one first. My goodness, come on, running in the back, faster, faster. Okay, okay. Uh, maybe I'll just give it a try. Yes. Um, Ah, that's great. The fear of making mistakes and letting down others. I was trained by Ajahn Chah not to fear mistakes. When I did make a mistake, I would make my teacher so happy he would laugh all day. <laughs> he knew I went to a good university. And he said, These Westerners go to good universities. How stupid they are. Because <laughs> one of the stupid things which I did 
is uh, it was a poor monastery when I first went up there. So we had things like toothpaste and toothbrushes and soap. But everything would be given to Ajahn Chah. He put it in a big water jar. And if he wanted some, say, toothpaste, he'd just put his hand in there. And if there was any, that's what you would get. No selection, but just whatever they had. And one day I needed some soap to bathe with. And the Thai word for soap is sabu. I was just learning the language. I said sapo. It's close enough to me. But for him, he looked at me and said, you know, what do you want sapo for? I said, no, to wash. <laughs> and he almost fell off his chair laughing. Because sapo means pineapple. <laughs> so I made a mistake. <laughs> Instead of asking for soap, I asked him for a pineapple. What do you want a pineapple for, for wash? And he enjoyed that joke for days, telling all the Thai people, I've learned something having these Western monks here. You know, in England, they're far more advanced. They wash with pineapples, where we Thai, we only wash with soap. <laughs> and that was only one of the stupid things I did. And I caused so much happiness for my boss. I think that's why Ajahn Chah liked having so many Western disciples. So in other words, you're just creating some happiness. And if you laugh at other people's mistakes, and they laugh, I always remember as a school teacher, I was taught this. If you make a stupid mistake in front of your class and they start laughing at you, you must laugh as well. Then your children, the disciples, will never laugh at you. They only laugh with you. It's a totally different experience. And the mistakes are where we learn. If you make a mistake, great. You've learned something. And that's where we grow. That was one of the wonderful things about Buddhism. When I read the Vinaya, there was not punishments. You just acknowledge your faults to another monk or to somebody. And then you are forgiven straight away and given some advice so you don't have to do it again. If you're afraid, you hide mistakes. You don't admit them, so you never learn. That's one of the reasons. You get a good boss. Yeah, of course you make mistakes. They'll accept that. But make sure you learn from those mistakes and become a better worker afterwards. Then no one will ever criticize you. And have fun, have joy. Even remember, just when uh, the head of the Ch Changi Airport um, Corporation who did a presentation with him at some sort of event on governance. And he said that how many of you go to work expecting the others to make you happy? How many of you go to work and he said, Ajahn Brahm does not need to answer this question because I know his answer. How many of you go to work with the intention of making other people happy? That's what I do every time I give a talk, every time I sign a book, every time I have my photograph taken. <laughs> you know, you smile to make somebody else happy because my job is to give happiness. So in the place where you work, how about resolving when you go to work or tomorrow whenever you go back to work you resolve to make one person happy on each work day not just yourself but other people then you become an employee who's creating this wonderful sense of family just you know, in your organization then you will never be dis uh, never be um, disappointing your boss, it's not just how you, what you work, but how you work with the kindness, with the joy, with the fun. And you become far more successful and no stress at all. And you don't disappoint anybody. A lot of time people think, oh, what will my boss think? A lot of the time the boss is not thinking about you, the boss is thinking about himself. <laughs> so just go ahead and do it. Okay? So you can relax. 
If that doesn't work in your company, you can come and join the BGF. <laughs> okay, another question? Yeah, next question, please. If you can, come forward to this side. Ah, is it the higher realms or is it which side? Uh, uh, Bobby the is up realms. there. Yeah. Oh, the heavenly beings. Thank you, <laughs> Thank you for the talk, Ajahn Brahm. Has as someone who has taken quantum mechanics, I understand your emotions. Yeah. Um, my question is, um, while I, when I have long, stressful working days, while I'm able to focus and be present, um, I find a lot of unconscious physical bracing that occurs, and I only feel it at the end of the day when, uh, when all, 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 all the meetings are over. Do you have any suggestions about like why that happens or also how to break that cycle? I, I think it's a habit, but it's also pretty unconscious. Yeah, it is a habit. You're conscious of it because you just described it to me. <laughs> so now you're conscious of it. Do something about it. And then this one gentleman, he told me that at his workplace, he meditates for one minute, only one minute, 60 seconds, uh, at every time the minute hand of the clock reaches you know, the, the, the 12 sign, one, one minute every hour of the day, he meditates. And all he does, he just closes his eyes and sits at his desk with his eyes closed, not answering telephone calls, not writing anything on his computer. And if his boss passes by, his boss thinks, oh, he's He's contemplating the contract, or he's thinking about how to improve this part of the work. But what you're really doing is taking one minute rest every hour. No one knows what you're up to. And you can have one minute of peace. And that means when you go and do the next 59 minutes, you have far better energy. A simple trick like that, you can try. And if that doesn't work, Go to the restroom, because you're constipated. <laughs> and please know that if you take 15 minutes in the restroom, you make up that time afterwards, because you're more efficient, more productive. That's something which was, you know, from those talks which I gave at the World Computer Conference, it was taken up by Harvard Business School. And they called it an investment of time. They had to just word it in a way which people in the business community could understand and appreciate. You invest 15 minutes sitting on the toilet relaxing. And you get those 15 minutes back with huge interest in the afternoon with work done more efficiently, more innovatively, with less stress on your body. You have to do that, otherwise you become unproductive, you become stressed out and sick. Okay, next question. Any more from the high realms? I don't expect many from the high realms because People get reborn in the higher realms because they're very, very wise and very kind. A very good evening, Ajahn. So basically... Could you take my... your mask off because oh. can't hear clearly. Oh. Good evening, Ajahn. So basically my work is not stress, but the factor that led to the stressful event in my workplace is because we just changed a boss. And for this boss, um, she is someone with a very high expectations. And no matter what her team members do, it's never enough. So for her, she only gives criticisms and uh, never encouragements. So that leads to the stressful environment within our team members as well. So how do we cope with these kind of people? How do you cope with these types of people? Gang up on her. <laughs> <laughs> In other words, all the other people in the team talk to each other and just, you know, together you say, that, you know, no one can do this much work in such a short time. And so they may criticize you, they may criticize others, criticize whoever. Remember, I, 
I've said this before to the BGF, you have two ears. Why are you given two ears? It's one to go in, one to go out. <laughs> so if people say silly things like that, say yes boss, yes boss, yes boss, but then just let it go out the other ear. If they say something which is praising to you, put one hand over your ear <laughs> so the praise can stay inside. And look, even bosses, bosses should know you get far more better results out of the people who work with you, not for you, but with you, if you're kind to them. Never underestimate the power of kindness. If one day you become a boss, please be kind to the people who work with you, who regard you as a boss. Find out what they like, how their family is. If their family is comfortable and successful, then when they come to work for you, now they feel like at ease. They're not just working on their computer thinking about their kids who are having trouble. And it's such an obvious thing when you care for one another in a workplace, you get far better results. I still remember somebody sending me this article about a firm called, in the UK, a building maintenance firm called Farrelly and Sons who won the award in one year, they doubled their profits with a very simple um, strategy. This firm banned all overtime. You could not do overtime. Any work, you couldn't take it home with you. What you did happened to be in the office, you kept to the work schedule and no overtime was allowed and their profits doubled. The productivity went up. Every person in that firm knew they could go home, relax and spend time with their family, or they could relax and go and listen to a talk from Ajahn <laughs> Their life became much more pleasant, healthy, and they found the staff turnover went to almost zero. No one wanted to leave that firm. You know what it's like if you get key staff, they get stressed out, burnt out, and then they leave. The whole firm suffers. It's one of the reasons why I'm being, you're being very kind to me this time, giving me some time so I can take a rest, so you don't burn me out. <laughs> if you burn me out, the Buddhist Society of West Australia would not allow me to come to the BGF anymore. <laughs> You're kind to others and others are kind to you. That's how life works. So when I try that, talk to your other workers, they probably have the same problems, and just together, just make a, a like a pact that we're not going to accept criticism. Accept praise. Praise works so much better. Every time if I come to the BGF and I say, it's a wonderful room you give me, thank you so much. Then I get the same room again, even more comfortable. If I say to someone, you make the best tea in the whole of Kuala Lumpur, then it's more likely I'll get that tea again tomorrow. <laughs> If I said there's a rotten cup of tea you made me today, of course you'd have that negativity. You never sort of improved your performance. That's how it works. If you have problems with your partner in life, praise them a lot. Darling, you're such a wonderful husband. You're so calm, you're so gentle, even if he's not. there's a good chance he might up his act because you appreciate those things. Okay, another question? Okay, is it for my card? Yes, one over there. I don't know why all the people who ask questions are sitting in the middle somewhere <laughs> so they can't get to you. Yeah, that's, that's very kind thing to do, yeah. 
Excellent. So I'm keeping the question uh, focused to the topic. And uh, you know, in today's fiercely competitive world, performance is the key. And uh, when you talk to many successful people, they say that, look, feeling a little nervous helps me to channel the energy and remain focused. Is this nervousness, feeling nervousness, is also a kind of a stress? I would say yes, it is a stress. And I don't think it keeps you focused. It keeps you unbalanced. The nervousness, you don't need to have the nervousness. You get far more focus from joy. I've seen this so many times. If I say something deep, then people don't pay attention. If I say something funny, a joke, I get total attention from you. The, honestly, the joyfulness is something which is much more powerful. And it's just for a little piece of information that that's what leads you to get the deep meditations, not by being nervous. There may be a monk behind you with a big stick if you get sleepy. That doesn't make you peaceful. That makes you scared. Focus, yes, but it's very unpleasant. You have joy. You're really enjoying what you're doing. It's so easy to stay focused. I learned that as a teacher a long time ago. You make these talks interesting, fascinating, and joyful, and you get much more attention. And also, people soak up much more of the information you're trying to, to give to them. Even in schools, when I was a school teacher, I tried my best to make things interesting. Even once, when I had to set an exam paper for the kids in the school in mathematics, I went to the principal and asked him, is it OK if I put a joke in the exam paper? And he said, yeah, OK. And so it was, a, it was say, an exam in a geometry. So I was a maths teacher. And it started off with two teachers, Sid Still and Be Quiet, <laughs> were standing 100 metres apart on this angle and that angle. But the sit still and be quiet was what teachers always tell their kids to do. Sit still and be quiet. And that was like a joke. And I remember just I had to invigilate, sit on the stage, and all the kids would come into the hall, and I'd say, sit down quietly, don't speak to anybody. Now the exam paper is upside down on your desk. When I say go, I look to the clock, now turn the exam paper over. You have an hour and a half to answer as many questions as you can. But please read them first of all. And you can see the nervousness, the stress on the kids' faces as they started this examination. And then they read down. And they got to my joke. And I remember looking at the kids' faces. And they were looking. <laughs> and they were quite shocked. There was a joke in the exam paper. And they looked up at me, and I had this big smile on my face. <laughs> and they smiled back. They relaxed. And because they relaxed, they did far better in that exam than was expected. You can understand why. The nervousness, the stress, you know the answers, but they just don't come out. That is not the way to do any sort of test or exam or to perform to your potential. Which is one of the reasons why you try and encourage people, whatever you're doing, have fun, enjoy it, and you always perform so much better. That's my understanding anyway. Yep, thank you. And here, here. I don't 
I'll, uh, I'll get Monk first, and then the man in the red afterwards, in the back. Just yes. very related to what you just said right now. Uh, as a monk, sometimes we have many rules, and we can fall into stress because of those rules. So, would you have any uh, <laughs> tricks? <laughs> now, honestly, I've been a monk for over 48 years now, and I find just about all the rules are just common sense. All the rules, they all come from what the Buddha taught to his son, Rahula. For those of you who can't keep five precepts, or eight precepts, or ten precepts, or 227 precepts, or 311 precepts, or a million precepts, just keep two precepts. The precepts which the Buddha gave to his son don't do anything which would harm another human being, or another being. And don't do anything which would harm yourself. And from that, you get just about all the rules for Buddhist monks and Buddhist nuns, all the five precepts. Why would you want to you know, drink alcohol, harm anybody? It just it hurts. It's basically, it's not worth it. So as a Buddhist monk, these rules are just second nature. You just, why would you want to do anything else? Look, I only eat in the morning time. It's second nature to do that. What would happen? Look how fat I am already. If I ate a meal in the evening, <laughs> I'd be dead by now. <laughs> so it's just, it's comfortable being a Buddhist monk. I, that's how I feel. All these things you're not allowed to do. You won't want to do them anyway if you were allowed. It just stress you out. One of the things I love as a Buddhist monk is just living a simple life. I live in a cave. I love living in a cave. Living in a house is far too much to clean up. <laughs> anyway, that's how I feel about things. No stress at all. Yeah? Quick. Oh, the back, the red, yeah. kind of red, yeah. Hello. Yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Um, yeah. Ajahn, may you be well? So, probably. Yeah, can you take your mask off while you're asking the question? Because otherwise I can't hear properly. Yeah, sure, sure. So, may you be well? So, I, I have questions rather obvious and fundamentals, like rather philosophical. So, what does success uh, mean? Because our topic is can we achieve success without stress? So, yeah, what is success? Success is happiness. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> Anyone? Do you have a question? Anyone here has a question? Yeah. Oh, come, come the mic. oh, you've got a long way to run. Right to the very front. Oh, there's one over here. Okay, over there first. Yeah, hello. Hi, Ajahn. Thank you for uh, very insightful uh, sharing here. Okay, yeah, okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sorry. Okay, uh, I, I'm a strong believer of what you've just shared in terms of having fun, you know, uh, bringing joy to yourself and, of course, to others. Uh, my problem is, at the end of the day, when it comes to resting, right, when I, when I close my eyes and uh, try to go to sleep, uh, the mind just keeps working, uh, despite trying very hard to just tell myself to... You know, just, just relax, but you know, it just keeps going and I think it takes a long time before I can really rest. So, perhaps some... You've already given me the answer there. <laughs> you try to go to sleep. We're going to start a meditation retreat tomorrow. I've seen this so often that people on the meditation retreat just, you know, when I give the talk, I lead a meditation, people have got their heads down like this. <laughs> they fall asleep. And when they go to bed, they can't go to sleep. <laughs> so I tell you, when you go to bed tonight, just try to meditate. <laughs> and when you're sitting meditation at the retreat, try to fall asleep. <laughs> you find you won't be able to do it. 
what's going on there is you're not being natural. Sometimes if you lay down in bed, is it comfortable in your bed? I figured this out years ago. Laying in a bed as a monk is one of the most comfortable positions you could ever be in. No one's asking you any questions. You don't have to do any chanting. You don't have anybody asking you to do anything. You're in your bed and it's comfortable. So I decided I don't want to go to sleep. Why would I want to go to sleep and ruin the most comfortable moments of my life? Ah, oh, I'm in the bed. I'm happy being in the bed. And as soon as I stop trying to go to sleep, you fall fast asleep. It's the trying and worrying about what would happen if you don't go to sleep keeps you awake. Stop the trying, that's not relaxing. Put everything down, the water, you're not holding anything. You need to let go and enjoy this moment. Comfortable place, it's warm, you're free, you don't have to do anything. And you soon fall fast asleep. Easy. Yeah, that's okay? Good, okay. Okay, uh, we have questions from the top. Hello, hello. Uh, good evening, Ajahn. Uh, my workplace, can you hear me, Ajahn? Yeah, where are you? Put your hand up. Uh, I'm here. Okay, yeah, okay, great. Yeah. Okay, uh, my question is, uh, my workplace is very dynamic. At the same time, I need to focus on the spot uh, while treating patients, okay? Oh, yes. Yeah. So, when I focus treating patients, I can't, um, I can't be aware of the happenings around my surrounding, which actually I need to. So, how can I get over with this? Okay, you... it's, I don't know, I can't really fully understand. You have to be aware of your surroundings and also the patient. But anyway, yeah. just include everybody in. <laughs> and I say that because it, it just reminded me of this simile of you know, whenever I do blessings for weddings. And you may have heard me say this before. I look in usually the, the eyes of the bride, first of all. And I say to her, you're now a married woman. From this day on, you must never think of yourself. You're married now. And she always understands and nods and says yes. And then I look at the groom, this guy, and I say the same to him, you're a married man now. You're a husband, you must not think of yourself. And in Australia, the guy always pauses. But eventually he agrees and says, okay, I won't think of myself. <laughs> and then still looking at the guy, I say, from this day on, I don't want you to think of your wife anymore. And I said to the wife, and say from this day on, you must not think of your husband. And I don't need to be a mind reader to know their thinking. Who have we got to bless our marriage? Can't we get someone better? <laughs> and so this crazy monk. And then I tell them the, the solution to that problem. When you're married, you must not think of yourself, nor must you think of your partner. You must think of us. The third way, you join everything together. So if you're in that situation in the hospital, or you're treating a patient, you have to be aware of people around you. Bring them all in. You're aware of us, but you also must be aware of yourself as well. You're included. And when you're aware of everybody in that situation, it's much easier to do the job. You can be aware of the patient, yourself, and also your surroundings. Give it a try. Thank you, Ajahn. Okay. So I know all about marriage. <laughs> I've never been married. Okay. Uh, hi, Ajahn. Hi. Um, I have a career advancement opportunity that I'm not sure should I take because um, like in, in, in Buddhist principle, we talk about contentment, about peaceful occupation. Yeah. And now this, uh, this career advancement might give me a lot of 
fame and money, you know, but also come with a lot of stress. So I'm not sure should I actually take it or actually can I handle the stress after that? I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm, yeah, but people say when opportunity comes because I'm ready, so I should take it, isn't it? That's why they came, because I'm ready already, isn't it? Is so it? So I'm ready. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> no, but what to do in decisions like that? You're a lay person, you've got any money? Take out a coin, toss it up. <laughs> Heads, I take the job, tails, I don't. <laughs> when you do it, don't do it now. <laughs> and when it falls down onto the ground, so it comes out heads, how do you feel? Heads, I'll take the job. Do you feel, mm, no, no, maybe I'll do two out of three. <laughs> <laughs> Tossing the coin doesn't make the decision for you. Tossing the coin allows you to see what you really want to do. And remember, you can you know, take that advancement if you really feel that you're ready for it, you can do it. And you can take that stress, you know how to take 15 minutes off when you really get tired and go to the restroom. If you're not brave enough to do that, you're not ready to take that job. You find if you understand that, putting down the glass of water, you can be far more productive and less stressed out. And in the end, yeah, you may get sort of more fame or just more money, but you know, that money will all be wasted in the increased medical bills, which you'll get because you wear out your body. If you're really enjoying what you're doing, it's hard to call it stress. So will you enjoy that new job? Will you still have time for your family and friends and the Buddhist societies? <laughs> if the answer is no, you don't have much time at all, then just don't do it. Remember, as that person asked, what is success? Success is happiness. It's not what other people think of you, it's how you feel about yourself and your relationships you have with others. And money can't buy that happiness. Yes, another one over here. One, one last question. Yeah. Uh, hi, hi, Ajahn. Um, you know, you gave the example uh, just now on you know holding a cup of water and then you know putting it down, effectively letting it go. You also talked about you know remembering the joy and happiness of life. Don't stress. Have fun. Enjoy it. Um, I'm trying. To, I mean, I took some notes. You know, don't fight against life. One thing at a time. Um, it sounds. I mean. I'm a pretty rational person and I perhaps, you know, um, rationally that would make sense. Um, what advice would you give to someone who sometimes overanalyze, um, overthink, and, you know, you give the answer to the gentleman just now on not trying, you know. Um, yeah. It sounds easy to do when you rationalize, but when it comes to the practice, yeah, I and mean, who in this room here doesn't want to be happy, you know, to reach enlightenment? Um, but it's... Yeah, but that's actually how you reach enlightenment. You don't try to become enlightened. You let go. That, one of the books which was on sale outside is one of the best books called The Art of Disappearing. You vanish. There's nothing left to do any trying. And that's when you get so peaceful and so still and so free and so blissed out. That's what we do on the retreat. You can't do enlightenment. You have to stop trying and stop doing. And you really understand just how peaceful this mind can become and how it's so incredibly successful with happiness. Success for a monk and for a nun is the happiness of enlightenment. Nibbāna and paramangs who come. Nibbāna is the highest happiness, said the Buddha. To understand exactly what that is, is quite difficult. But we do that eventually. And the lovely thing is that people can do it. They do do it. So my advice for you is to associate with those sorts of people 
who are happy, who are actually succeeding without any stress, who are happy and peaceful and joyful and highly productive. Honestly, as a monk, I could say that I've been very productive in my career as a monk. Many monasteries I've been responsible for, many monks I've trained, now many nuns, you've made it possible for them to become nuns. I keep getting invited back to the Buddhist Gem Fellowship. Why, I must be doing something good, you're willing to invite me back again. But I enjoy it. I have a lot of fun teaching all of you. And it's wonderful when you laugh at some of my jokes, even though they're silly jokes. And you may think you've heard these jokes before, but please know I've heard them more times than anybody. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. All right. Uh, one last question. Yeah, oh really, last question. Thanks. <laughs> Um, good evening, Arjun. I can hear you. You don't create joy. Joy is there. It's like a default state. When you stop doing things and trying to get things and just enjoy where you are, make peace with it, be still, be kind. It's amazing just how much joy comes up. It is like the idea of a default state. If you have a computer and you don't click the mouse or do anything or say anything, what happens to the computer screen? It goes to, to its default state. And then eventually it turns off. And then you're peaceful. You're not disturbed. You can relax and rest. And you get energy back again. And energy becomes joyful and happy. And one of the other interesting things you find out when you become very still and peaceful, what in Buddhism we call the five hindrances, the Pajaniwarana, disappear. And when they disappear, also what appears, or what disappears, is a tandi and arati. Tandi is a weariness, and arati is a discontent. When you become still, all of those things vanish. You see things so clearly, and you become energized and happy. That's how the Buddha taught. So when you really meditate, you know if a person's meditating properly because they've got big smiles on their face, and they're joyful. You don't create that joy, it's like it's always there but you destroy it by wanting to do something else. That's why I call it default. So you don't have to do anything, just to restrain yourself and stop doing things. That's what we're going to be doing on a retreat. We don't do meditation. We don't do anything. We just sit there with our eyes closed, being kind to your body, kind to the mind. And the meditation happens, in spite of you. All right, quick, yeah, I, ask uh, a question. Evening, Ajahn. Um, yeah, just, just speak, yeah, louder, please, your okay. voice. Uh, evening, Ajahn. Uh, my question is actually, um, how can I deal with someone that is, um, have the high value of fair, everything that he, one thinks is in fair, but in, in actual, we, we it's, to me, it is difficult to achieve fairness, right, in, in everything that we do. So I, I felt that stressful yeah. in this kind of relationship. Yeah. Yeah. So maybe some tips from you? The tips. Okay. Well, to be fair, try that calendar method. <laughs> Tell him on the even days of the month, he can decide what fair is. And the odd days of the month, you decide what fair is. That's fair. So you can actually see another sort of uh, interpretation of what fair is. And also, if that person is your partner in life, it's very easy to influence partners. 
using Buddhist psychology. What you do is when he or he or she, I don't know what the partner is, if they behave just selfishly and irresponsibly, don't even listen to it. Don't say anything, don't criticize it at all. One ear to go in, one ear to go out. And don't keep thinking about it. When your partner does something which is a good thing, which is you know, how you want them to behave, always praise them. If it is like a husband, just smother them with kisses. Oh, that's so cute, that's so kind of you. Thank you for that. That's how you change them. They're very easy to change if you know how to do it. Give them positive reinforcement to the good things which they do in life. And don't give them negative reinforcement to anything negative they do. Just don't even mention it, ignore it. It actually works. Guaranteed, or you get your money back. <laughs> okay. Okay. All right. Uh... Okay, thank you uh, for an uh, engage, engaging evening from the audience. Uh, I hope you are, we all have learned a lot from that questions, and thank you for those questions. And uh, we have come to the end of the session so, yeah, this evening, the Dharma talk. So uh, once again, I'd like to ask that question. Can success be done without stress? Yes, so you got the answer. Those who have already got the answer and know what to do, please go around and spread the joy. And uh, those who are still striving, continue to do so. I'm sure that one day success will be yours. So uh, before we conclude, let's uh, invite Ajahn to do a transfer of merits. Uh, okay. Just to conclude it. Yeah. Here we go. Idamenya <laughs> Ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo idame nyati na ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo idame nyati na ho tu sukita hon tu yata yo Let's say sadhu three times. Sadhu, sadhu, sadhu. Thank you, Ajahn Brahm. Okay, very Ajahn good. Ajahn has to go for his uh, meeting now. Yeah, I apologize for rushing off, but now you've got a meeting of the Bikuni Committee for UK. So can I give them all your best wishes? Yes. Yeah, very good. <laughs>